Welcome to session three of Preparing for the Future of Legal Education, Online Teaching Tips and Techniques. My name is John Mayer. I'm the Executive Director of CALI, the Center for Computer Assisted Legal Instruction. Um, just got a, a few housekeeping things to handle. Um, we've been working like crazy over the weekend on the website, uh, especially if you go look at the individual sessions pages. Um, besides, of course, the video, which you got right away, there's, uh, there's now a text transcript of the session um, and, uh, you know, heavily annotated uh, with links and references. Tanya talked a lot about um, instructional designers, um, scholarly papers and things. I went through, found all those links and, uh, and put them in there. There's also a, a podcast version if you want to listen to this without, uh, without watching the videos. Um, of course, our slides. And all the links that, uh, that she mentioned and that were there, I also, I, I duplicated that in, in this list, or we duplicated this list. There's the uh, Instapoll, the second Instapoll. The first Instapoll got lost. Um, I didn't grab a screen grab of that. Um, something to learn. Session two is also up there as a, as a video um, and a podcast and our slides and the links mentioned including where to buy the green unitard that I talked about, or the, or the HyperX Cloud Alpha S-Wired 7.1 surround sound gaming headset, which I'm wearing right now. And no, they're not giving me any money for sponsoring them. Um, so, but we're here on session three. And uh, the, the, the topic of this session is assessment, formative and summative. And we've got two awesome folks here to talk about that. Greg Brandis and uh, Nicole Lefton. Greg, you're the Dean of St. Francis Law School? I am the Dean, that's right, yep. Awesome, and Nicole, you're, you're with? With Hofstra. Uh, with Hofstra. I'm, I, I'm I, not I, the I, Dean. <laughs> but you're not the Dean. And I knew that because I'm looking at it and yet my mind blanked the minute okay. I, had, I had to come out with my mouth, so I apologize. Okay. So without further ado, I'm gonna stop sharing and uh, let you guys uh, take it over. Well, thanks, John. Welcome, everybody. Uh, again, pleased to be with you. It's really wonderful to have this invitation. And Kelly, thank you for doing uh, this course for everybody. It seems like it's terrific and uh, great content and very timely. And uh, everybody's really learning a lot. So we're really honored. I'm really honored to be part of it. Um, Nicole, I imagine you want to say a couple of words, too. I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you all very much. Just, uh, you know, I'm, I'm at Hofstra and I am uh, in charge of academic support and bar prep. And so this was a really interesting thing, Greg and I have known each other for years, but looking at this and looking at some of the, the things that I've been doing, particularly with the skills classes that, that we run um, for students in the bottom third of the class and thinking about how we're going to be able to um, really sort of track their performance so that we don't see them, you know, kind of get to the situation where at the end of the semester they fail and, and we didn't, see why or we weren't able to help them along the way. So this was a really interesting and fun project for us to sort of collaborate on. And we're happy to be here to share with you. Yeah, thank you, Nicole. And uh, we're uh, especially pleased that everybody is interested in this topic and so many people are joining us. Um, I'm gonna share some slides and we will uh, kind of go back and forth a little bit through them. Uh, first with a little bit of context setting on uh, where exactly we are in the moment. Um, but here are our topics for the day. We have sort of five topics in, you think about 50 minutes, maybe a little bit less, uh, all the way from context to, to uh, what the future looks like for faculty, at least the way we think about it. Um, along the way, though, we'll talk about how learning science contributes to your success as an online teacher. If you do things in the ways that people expect these days uh, for online to be conducted. Um, it's also really important to focus on uh, assessment as an important part of your culture and how we get there. It will be a major part of the time we spend together. Um, we're going to talk a little bit of accountability uh, coming from not just from the ABA, which of course is uh, very interested in this particular area today uh, by virtue of its standards, but also from our students because they have a set of expectations to be concerned about as well. Uh, and then lastly, of course, we'll talk a bit about faculty. So just for a little bit of context setting, uh, my how the world has changed in just a few months uh, from a world where there were just a handful of folks who were really doing distance education in legal education in a very significant way 
Uh, and there was a lot of interest and there was a fair amount of research and support going on uh, to figure out how to do this most effectively um, from a sort of an academic standpoint uh, to a day where every law school in the world, uh, I dare say, is uh, conducting classes online if they are still conducting classes. Um, and of course, uh, to a world where everybody's exploring what's next and how exactly we should go forward with all of this. So, Cole? Sure, so I'm sure a lot of people have, have seen this. Harvard expects a robust, high quality online program for the fall of 2020. And, and what does that mean for Harvard for us? Um, this was really sort of interesting. This was a, a great quote um, from John Manning, um, who's the Dean of Harvard Law School. And when I read it, I thought this is exactly what I sort of was thinking. We were thrown into um, the online world very abruptly, obviously mid semester. Um, and now that we're getting ready for, for the fall semester, um, I think the particular part that I liked was, you know, this coming semester though asks uh, something different of us to use technology to design even more creative, exciting and excellent experiences in support of learning, building community and engaging in the services that help those most in need. Uh, and that is fundamental to the work lawyers do. That's really sort of what, what I've been thinking a lot about, what my team's been thinking a lot about. Um, and as somebody who's kind of steeped in um, online learning, I came from Kaplan where everything was, was online and I've always been a big proponent of distance education and was on a committee at Hofstra where we looked at it um, and was very optimistic about it. And then when it happened you know, so quickly this spring, I felt really at sea. So now sort of stepping back and thinking about, it's not a question of doing the same thing we were doing before um, and just doing it online. It's a question of thinking about what we can do better and what we can do differently. And the, you know, what we used to always refer to as the sage on a stage model of having a, um, you know, sort of the doctrinal classroom structured in the same way that it's been operating in law schools for, I don't know, hundreds of years, a long time. Um, maybe it's time that we, we think about how we can you know, build a better mousetrap and do things a little bit differently. Yes, and I think it's worth adding that that is exactly what assessment as a process helps you do. Mm -hmm. uh, so the tools we'll talk about today, both things about formative assessment, uh, also of course summative assessment, we'll define those terms for us. We'll talk about the process of creating those things and why you do it, how you do it, how you get from here to there, uh, all of those things contribute to achieving that better mousetrap, uh, doing it better, faster, uh, more effectively for the students as we go along. So with that as sort of context setting, let's get into our first of the major topics. And this one is, of course, how learning science works to support this. Now, we know a great deal more about learning than we used to know. Uh, back uh, 40 years ago or so, uh, everybody was pretty well in the dark about how people went about that process. Fortunately, the, the science of studying learning has come a long way since then. What we've settled on as a set of sort of best practices is represented by the keys you see in the middle of the page here. And that is a curriculum that is evidence-based. And it is evidence-based in that we have mapped and understand the relationship between all of the activities we ask students to undertake to have an experience that they learn from all the way through to what we're trying to achieve in the program. So we have to map learning activities in an individual course to the course outcomes we intend for that class, whatever those outcomes may be, and we'll talk a little bit about what those mean. We also then have to understand how to assess whether people are achieving those outcomes in the class or not. And so we have to understand how an assessment attaches to an outcome and be able to demonstrate that connection uh, to ourselves and then of course in the work that the students do. And lastly, all the courses that students take should have a rational connection to the program outcomes. Now by program, of course, we're talking about the JD program here in most cases. You might have other programs as well. The same principle applies to those. But chances are you have somewhere between seven and 15 outcomes you've identified as things that people should learn and be able to do when they complete your JD program. 
That too is required now by the standards. And mapping that back to all the courses and how the courses contribute is the beginning part of how learning science helps us improve the teaching and the actual delivery of the education. So we're not doing a lot of things differently in the classroom. We are doing a lot differently around the classroom, and we might be doing things differently in the classroom too, depending on how we decide to go about that process. So our first little bit here, we'll be talking about how we connect the dots between things that people are undertaking for learning experiences. I'll define that a little bit more in a second, all the way up to outcomes of the program. Before we do that though, what do I mean by learning experiences? Well, when we assign a set of readings, it contains typically a set of cases that students are supposed to read and analyze and understand. And that's, that's what we mean. Any kind of activity that's assigned to the students, whether it's in class or outside of class, is assigned for some reason. It's supposed to accomplish something that leads toward, we hope, the outcomes of that class. So outcomes can be as simple as they need to understand and be able to apply the substantive law of, uh, I don't know, adverse possession, for example. Um, or it can be a more complex outcome that's related to skills and the way to, for example, conduct a client interview on a particular area of the law. We can make outcomes however we want to make them, and we should make them, and we should understand what we're trying to achieve in our individual course uh, every time we put a course together and put it out there. The process of online learning, and those of you who know, read my bio know I've been at this a long time, uh, it forces that upon us. Uh, we have to think it through before we can build it, and we have to build it before we can put students into it. Uh, so it gives us the opportunity to do what's referred to in the trade as backward design. And uh, this is an illustration of backward design in some of the steps that I've already talked about. So we can start with program outcomes, but as individual faculty members, we're mostly gonna begin with course outcomes. Um, we will understand that criminal procedure has a role to play in the overall outcomes of the JD program or constitutional law or whatever our subject might be. And so we understand in a general way, we don't have to prove that up uh, as specifically as individual teachers as perhaps our associate dean who's in charge of institutional research might have to prove it up down the road. But we do have to connect our course outcomes to all the little things we ask students to do. So starting with the top, we see program outcomes, then course outcomes, and right below that module objectives. Now, module is just a word that's frequently used in online learning to describe a discrete bit of content that is intended to deliver a particular bit of learning particular purpose, particular topic. It could be, for example, the Sixth Amendment uh, under criminal procedure that is our module topic. And we have various objectives for that uh, connected with it. So the module is just a term of art, but you could think of it as the weeks in your syllabus. Um, that's how we think of it in the online world. Uh, we sort of design around that same idea of what are students doing this week? And what will I do in class this week to support that learning? So that's all we mean there. And then all of the things we ask students to do are those learning activities. And you see some examples of the kinds of things that we might do, and they're very typical things. Uh, very typical things we'll still do in an online sort of structure of things. Uh, all of those at the end of the day should lead to an outcome. There should be some reason we have them doing that or reading that, that case or undertaking that uh, drafting exercise or whatever it might be. So along the left-hand side, you see an arrow going down, and that's our focus on outcomes drilling all the way to the bottom. On the right-hand side, we have linking and iteration because it doesn't end with one cycle downward. We then have to take a look at how well those things do connect all the way back up to the top. We look for those links, and we kind of iterate this cycle around and around until we make the course as good as we're able to make it um, with that process of thinking through how one thing connects to another. And if you find you have a learning activity that isn't contributing, you'll find a different one. Student's time is precious. There's better things to do with that time. So here's just an example of how a program outcome is connected to this activity. 
So our example program outcome is upon completion of the JD program, students should competently and professionally develop research and write core legal documents required for first year practice in at least two substantive areas of practice. Now I'm gonna guess that your school's program outcomes don't look like that. Uh, what this one does that many don't do is it follows a little moniker called SMART, which is specific, measurable, agreed upon, realistic, and time-framed. It has all those pieces in it so that we can actually prove whether or not we accomplished it. I mentioned earlier, you might have an academic dean who spends a lot of time on institutional research trying to prove those things. The more smart your objectives are, and that's true of your course outcomes as well, the more you can prove you actually achieved them by putting in things you can actually measure when you write those outcomes. So that's just a little bit about how we go about creating our outcomes and starting to work from outcomes down to our activities. Now, Nicole. I think the thing to think about, which sometimes we all forget because we're sort of in our own silo teaching our own, you know, discrete course, particularly if it's a doctrinal course, is that the outcomes are really complex um, and interdependent. And this is actually uh, Greg, Greg's slide, which I think is really great. It's a really complicated origami and there's so many different things, but you have to sort of, you know, each fold is its own piece and the whole thing together is this complex yet sort of strange and beautiful, you know, contraption. Um, and, and they all have to come together to, you know, produce a competent professional. So, you know, when you talk about the ultimate learning objective, I guess, for us, it's to train our students to make the world a better place by becoming wonderful lawyers who understand, you know, their mission, whatever that mission is, whatever they're going to do with their law degree. And, and so it's complex, right? There are a lot of different parts to it. Obviously, there's the substantive law that we're teaching. And, you know, that can be broken down into modules, that can be broken down into issues, that can be broken down into subject, subtopic, topic, however you want to do it. Um, and then there are the skills involved. There are the sort of the general skills that every lawyer needs to have, the ability to, you know, um, to be clear and well organized and write clearly, the ability to have you know good reading comprehension skills, analytical reasoning, um, you know what we call multidimensionality, always thinking about what the counter argument is going to be and understanding how to rebut that counter argument, and then there are the sort of the discrete skills depending on different areas, whether it's courtroom skills or oral advocacy or writing a brief or you know sort of the, the more nuanced things. Um, and then, and then there's another skill which I think sometimes we don't um, pay enough attention to in the in the classroom. And I've really been working hard to to bring this into all our courses. Um, uh, and we're actually doing we we have a um, a grant from Access Lex to work on this with regard to to bar um, success, which is um, metacognitive skills. How do we teach our students to be better learners? How do we teach our students to understand? lifelong learning skills, not just in law school, but, you know, going forward that are going to help them understand their own strengths and weaknesses, their own areas for development, and how to measure those and how to pivot and how to refocus when they do struggle without, you know, giving up on, on the areas that they're doing well. Um, and so it's complicated, obviously, but there's a lot, I think, a lot of opportunity with online learning to to think about all these different parts, parts and test um, students and assess students on all these different parts in a much more meaningful way than I think um, we can often do in the classroom or in live classroom. It becomes easier to do with some of the online tools, right, Nicole? Right, exactly. That's part of the, part of the yeah. And so, so again, so, you know, some of the, the, the terminology that we use and the ways to achieve and track outcomes, I mean, most of you know this, but just to sort of run through it, um, I'm going to go slightly out of order here and start with summative assessments. Summative assessments, final exams. Every law school does this. Um, it's very difficult. I mean, I guess there are some classes where the final exam or the summative assessment is a final writing project. But obviously, that's sort of the, here's your grade. Um, and it's evaluative. It's sort of the measurement to see how did the student, what did the student learn? How did the student, you know, absorb the information and how can the student then use that information um, based on this, this final project? And 
all law schools have it, but the problem that I see, and I think we all see, is that sometimes that's such an important part of the grade, or that may actually be the only part of the grade, that it doesn't really give a student an opportunity to sort of um, learn from it. I mean, I don't know how many of you have faced this. I've seen this countless times where, um, you know, we post the final exam grades and they can come and they can take a look at their final exam and more often than not they don't even bother to come they care about the number and then they've moved on to the next semester so summative exams in and of themselves are, are useful but they're not um, developmental i would say um, so then that gets to formative assessments which could be anything from midterm to lots of different ways to um, measure and assess um, students' understanding and ability throughout the course. Um, and, if you, and if you create good formative assessments and you really spend the time giving the students the feedback from those formative assessments, rather than just giving it and giving a score, which doesn't really do much more than a summative assessment, you allow the student to really develop those metacognitive skills and develop the, the the understanding of where they're struggling and where they're strong and how they can they can um, improve. And so, you know, as the slide says, law schools are, are good at summative, we're not so good at formative. And there are lots of reasons why we're not good at formative. I mean, you know, when I taught property and I had uh, close to, I guess, close to 100 people in my class, I did give a midterm. Um, and I did give multiple choice and an essay, and it was incredibly brutal <laughs> because then there I was trying to grade, you know, 100 essays and turn it around in a meaningful time because if I give them their feedback three weeks later, the semester's almost over, they don't even care anymore. They forgot about the midterm. So, so some of the assessments are tough, but there are probably a lot more ways, particularly with the online abilities, that we can give them assessments where they can self-critique, and Greg and I are going to talk about that, they can get the feedback quickly. We can go over it and give them feedback as a class. They can peer review or self grading or things like that. So it's meaningful and it's timely. Um, and, and I think online learning really provides a lot of great opportunities for that. And, you know, in addition to the fact that I think it makes our students perform better, it makes them get more out of law school. It makes them feel more in control of their, um, performance in law school as opposed to, you know, I remember when I was in law school and I think it's still true, people used to say, you know, your grades were based, the professor would throw the final exams down the stairs and the ones closest to the top of the stairs would get a better grade. No one really always felt very connected, you know, the way you thought you understood a class versus the grade you got and it didn't necessarily correlate. But so now this helps us with our students, but it also helps us um, because we're required to do this, right? We're now under, under um, standard 314, we're required to um, develop assessments and, and measure success of our courses and not just have these learning objectives in a vacuum and say that we're teaching to them, but actually show that we're teaching to them. So, um, do you want to- right, Well, we'll go back and answer a question that I asked back on uh, slide six that you probably didn't uh, notice down at the bottom of this page, I asked the question, so why exactly does everybody teach the Paul's graph case and torts? Uh, everybody does, and uh, probably because it's a cool case. It's a fun case to teach, but in fact, there are learning outcomes that are in that case that we do want to teach people about. And so we want to teach them about the Cardozo view and about the Andrews view. And it's a great vehicle for conversations around uh, analysis skills as well, because the case is an older case, it's written in an older style, and take students a little bit of time to sort of work through and understand how the arguments are put together. So it's a great case on the facts, because it's a fun set of facts, but also actually serves very directly the learning outcomes we have in a torts class around these two tests for causation. So we've got our, our great um, uh, reasoning behind defining your outcomes, now we're going to talk about then assessing outcomes in the formative and summative ways uh, that we've been talking about. So other kinds of learning activities, Nicole. You're using a lot of these now, or you've been using a lot of these now, quizzes, handouts, offline readings, online readings. I mean, these are all things that, you know, if you look through this list of um, ways to measure student abilities, you're doing probably most of these. And I think that it's now just a question of sort of figuring out how many of these are, you know, are, um, 
are more easily usable online. I mean, some of the things, the Cali lessons that we can assign, which, you know, not to, not to plug our Cali lessons, but they're excellent. And I'm using them now and I'm going to be using them in our fall semester because I think it's a great way with students so isolated in their own spaces and not in the classroom to let them have these outside little, you know, assignments that they can, they can take and they can measure. Um, but it, and again, just look through this list and, you know, if you were to check all that would apply, uh, I mean, if it were me checking it, I'm not a big Twitter person. But other than that, I think that, um, that, that pretty much everything else on here is fair game for me. And so I think it's great to start thinking about this, that it's not, you know, so foreign to us. It's not stuff that we haven't used before. It's just using it in a slightly different way. Yeah, and every one of those things can be used for an assessment purpose, too. The activity undertaken by the students, if you have an appropriate evaluation for it and understand how it connects to the, uh, the learning outcome that you're looking for, every single one of these things we already do, we can easily do and connect them right back to our outcomes. So uh, we want to go through, give you an, a kind of an example of how to create an assessment plan for a class. So it begins obviously with understanding what you need to assess. Those are the outcomes we've been talking about. But then it goes into asking yourself how best to frame up that assessment structure. This is an example of a class that uh, we had at one of my institutions in contracts, represents the nature of the formative assessment that was undertaken in that course. So quite a lot of multiple choice um, activity involved in the course, um, quite a bit of uh, uh, reading assignment uh, reviews. We'll talk about what those mean in a second and then quite a bit of writing. And because this was a first year sort of contracts class, we didn't do as much of the practical skills oriented writing as we probably should have. We were pretty focused heavily on typical IRAC analysis and being able to write a law school essay effectively in the design of this model. But it ends up being quite a lot of assessment. It gives you quite a few opportunities to find out how the students are doing. More importantly, perhaps it helps the students understand all along the way how they're doing so they can go back and do additional work if they need to and also get to the end of the term and hopefully see a final grade that reflects the work they've done during the rest of the class as they understood it from their own work that's what formative assessment does for us it helps the students form their own understanding as they go along now of course this is quite a bit of stuff to put together so uh, nobody expects you to get there day one uh, but it is a pretty important thing to be thinking about how to structure it as you go along. Notice also this is represents 40% of the final grade. Uh, with formative assessment, you may not want to make it high stakes. In other words, in terms of the percentage of impact it has, any one of these multiple choice questions on this uh, assessment plan really didn't make that much difference in the final grade. You want just enough that everybody takes it seriously and doesn't want to miss out on the possibility of that you know, one half of 1% <laughs> or whatever it ends up being, depending on how many of these you have. So I do recommend that they are graded assignments, not ungraded assignments, uh, in order for everybody to take them as seriously as they should. And believe me, students really do. Uh, they actually like doing these more than you think. Uh, so the summative assessment in that class was 100 multiple choice and one essay, proctored, rigid timing, the whole ball of wax we do for final exams, very typical sort of stuff. And in this design, it was 60% of the final grade. So very traditional balancing of the weight of that final exam in terms of the final score in the course. When you put it all together though, it ends up being about 250 multiple choice assessments. Again, this takes time to put together. 269 reading assignment quizzes. I'll get into that just a second a bit more. And then eight essay writing experiences by the time they got through with the formative and summative assessments in the class. So they had a chance to practice trying it out uh, quite a bit when they learned new material to go and apply it. And as we know from uh, learning science, uh, adult learning in particular, uh, those folks learn best by practice, uh, experiencing it, uh, understanding how they did, going back and reviewing, trying again. That iterative experience is really important to learning for some particular kinds of learners. Uh, I wanted to tell you just a little bit about this idea of reading assignment quizzes. Uh, you assign lots of reading uh, in your courses. And of course, the 
uh, students uh, do a good job of it or they don't and you try to discern that in the live classroom as you conduct the Socratic dialogue or other activities with the students. But students often don't really have a good sense of how well they consume the reading. Uh, or they may have a false sense of security about how well they consume the reading. So one of the things that we did in one of my institutions is to create a set of these quiz questions that students were given at the time they completed their assignment or they checked the box to say that I completed the reading assignment in the uh, online learning management system, up comes the little quiz that says, well, check, test your knowledge. Uh, these kinds of questions are not complex MBE style questions. They tend to be much more focused on the content of the reading. And uh, believe it or not, students love them. Uh, you'd be surprised the, perhaps that students think there's extra work uh, involved in it. They were untimed and open book. Uh, they were designed to reinforce the reading points that we particularly wanted to be sure students got out of the reading itself as part of their learning activities designed to lead to one of our outcomes. And uh, once you started giving them, students loved doing them because it helped them frame and understand how well they had done the reading and know that if they didn't get it, they should go back and take another look. So the example you have is just an example of a kind of question you can easily put together. Um, this uh, is a criminal procedure course. We're studying um, Sixth Amendment and uh, the uh, confession law and so on. And we're just asking the students here to sort out which case was which and what outcome was most important in helping to define what the court means by deliberate elicitation. So the court the student will have read all these cases. Most of them are examples drawn from one of the cases. We're really just asking the student to be specific about which one it was uh, that was the, the um, uh, particular uh, uh, fact of that case that was pivotal in the court's decision on that particular issue. Pretty easy to put together. You can start building them over time as you continue to teach the class. Uh, if you had uh, five questions on each reading assignment as a goal to start with, you'd be doing a lot of good in helping students get back to what it was they were after uh, or really all about. But of course, that's just one example. They can be multiple choice. They can be a lot of other kinds. There's a lot of other great kinds of formative assessments. Nicole? So I, again, I, I teach, um, primarily I teach a class, a second semester 1L class for to students in the bottom third of the, of the class. Um, and then again, um, first semester 2L, again, for the, the same cohort. And so, you know, I guess sort of stepping back, you know, what am I teaching? I'm, I'm trying to teach them skills. I'm trying to teach them skills with regard to test taking, um, you know, particularly multiple choice and essay and, and MPT style questions. Um, but I'm trying to sort of teach them about the skills that are needed in those questions and multiple choice, I think is just a great way to assess, to create formative assessments. Um, so, you know, my stepping back and thinking about it, I'm thinking about the learning objectives um, are good multiple choice question. And I'm not talking about sort of a black letter law multiple choice question, you know, which of the following is the best uh, description of, you know, or definition of arson. Um, I'm talking about a, a more test-led question, something that they might see on the bar exam, um, something that's testing on a lot of different things. And so obviously a well-drafted multiple choice question is testing on a, on a substantive rule of law and probably not sort of the general, you know, what's the definition of arson, but something a little more nuanced. Um, they should be, I mean, if they're well-drafted, they should, there should be some kind of a reading comprehension component in it, something where students need to, you know, pay close attention or potentially miss key information or misunderstand key information. And then, you know, there's always sort of this, you know, this uh, thinking like a lawyer, which is what we're, we're supposed to be training them to do. And what does that really mean? That's analytical reasoning. That's multidimensional thought where they're looking at it from both sides. If I were arguing that there was arson, I would be able to say X, Y, and Z. If I were trying to think about defenses or exceptions to arson, I would be thinking about A, B, and C. And now again, if I'm looking at those defenses or exceptions, how would I come back and argue against those? So what I like to do is, um, is take, the, take apart a multiple choice question and think about it from sort of what I call like the wrong answer pathologies. And that's, if you could just advance the slide, please. 
You want me to move on? Yeah, no. please. Thanks. Um, and and so that's kind of thinking about what a well-drafted multiple choice question is going to do. The right answer is going to be focused on whatever the right answer is. But what like what is the wrong? Like what's the what's sort of the underlining uh, underlying sneaky um, part of the wrong answer? What's the wrong answer sort of trying to identify, or why is it wrong? And I want students to step back and think not just what the right answer is, but why the wrong answers are wrong. And so when I teach this, I talk a lot about um, different kinds of wrong answers. And I think it's a great way to sort of test them um, and assess their ability not only to get the right answer, but to understand why wrong answers are wrong. And so obviously there are the wrong answers that um, have to do with mastery of, this, of the substantive rule of law. And those are wrong answers that would either incorrectly state the rule or potentially refer to a non-existent rule, which you might see on the bar exam. I always tell my students it's, you know, the answer choice that says the law in Lefton's case or something like that. They're usually a little more subtle on the bar exam, but they'll often, you know, pick something out of a hat that's completely, you know, not a rule. Um, and then there are, there are the reading comprehension um, wrong answers, which are really plentiful and I think it's a, it's a great thing in a multiple choice question because again that's what differs that look, that's why a multiple choice question is more than just testing on the rule of law so there could be a question an answer choice that contains facts that are not in the question or uh, that contains mistaken facts um, or that uh, that has um, a correct statement but it's irrelevant the answer choice is, is true but it's not relevant with regard to what the question is really asking. Maybe that sort of should go under thinking like a lawyer too. Um, and then there's also the, the answer choice that actually has some kind of a reading comprehension issue because it's got the right facts and it's got the right law, but it's like, therefore, you know, the sky is blue when the answer is supposed to be that the sky is pink. Um, and then obviously there are the, the wrong answers that are trying to test the student's ability to think like a lawyer. Um, questions that have an, are an answer choice that's too absolute, always, never, which, you know, is rarely true in, um, or never true, no, rarely true in, uh, in common law, maybe in civil law, but not in common law. Um, answer choices that don't consider the exception, um, like I was saying before, what's the exception, what's the defense, How, where can you possibly go, the rule within the rule. Um, answer choices that could be correct, but aren't the best choice based on what's really, you know, the, the real nugget, the real issue that's being tested. And that's why when I'm talking to students and saying, you know, very often there are two right answers and one is just more right than another. Um, and finally, the answer choices that don't consider a defense, which is sort of, I guess I said that already. Um, can you advance it? Um, and, and so, you know, the same thing, you know, holds true with, I mean, here we say essay questions, but this could also be an MPT style question too. Um, you know, sort of stepping back, as Greg said, and thinking about the learning objectives and building everything backwards from your summative assessments, through your formative assessments, to how you're teaching it, to your learning objectives. That's, I think, the best way to design a class where all the pieces fit together and where the students understand what they're learning, why they're learning it, and how they're ultimately going to be able to see if they've in fact mastered it. And, you know, I mean, I think that the, the, the learning objectives with regards to an essay or an MPT are, are very similar to a multiple choice question. But in addition, you know, and one thing I didn't put on here, which I guess I should have with regard to MPT would be, you know, the ability to, to navigate and sift through a lot of material and figure out what's relevant and what isn't and how to use it. But in addition to sort of the mastery of the substantive law and the reading comprehension skills and the thinking like a lawyer, obviously anything where there's writing involved is going to require students to master their organization and clarity of writing. And that's through what I call macro organization, which is sort of the big picture organization of their answer. And then the micro organization within each issue um, or section, some organizational format, whether it's IRAC or CRAC or CRAC or whatever format you're teaching that they can use to lay out all the pieces and, and avoid some, you know, an argument that's too conclusory or disorganized. Um, and then obviously, you know, writing style and grammar. And I don't know about you, but I struggle with this because, you know, when we're getting students in graduate school, they should be able to write already. Um, very often they struggle with that. You know, when we have um, foreign students who struggle with it. Um, and we have, you know, 
lots of students who struggle with it. So trying to give them advice without sort of teaching people how to write, but just on effective communication skills and um, active sentence structure and things like that. Um, and testing them on that, I think, is, is something that helps them develop their communication skills, whether it's essay, multiple choice, or any, I'm sorry, or, or uh, MPT, or anything else that they're writing when they graduate during their summer internships and jobs and clinics and the like. So, um, so uh, thank you. So one thing that I use, and a shout out to Chris Franklin, who I think is, is listening, um, Chris has, has put together a fantastic book that we actually use for our fall 2L course um, called Legal Reasoning Case Files. And the book, um, give like a huge plug. No, it's an awesome book. It's really a series of sort of um, MPTs on steroids. And I think, there are, I think there are about six in there. We only use a few. And we basically break, I think we use three, and we break our semester up into, we have a little intro part, and then we have basically three modules. And each module um, is, you know, effectively uses one of these, these three chunks. And the thing that, 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 I'm, that I'm showing here, which I love, is um, the, the rubric that, that Chris provides. Because I think this is the hardest thing with, with anything written, is giving students meaningful um, feedback that they can then take and improve. And the scoring becomes really difficult, right? Because if you just score them based on, did you hit all the issues? Did you hit all the relevant rules? The application of the facts, of, you know, effects to those rules and then the conclusion, that's important. But there's a lot more to it that I think is important that we sometimes lose sight of because then that just becomes sort of about this like plug and play thing and they're not necessarily developing their skills in communication and writing an organization. So I, I love this um, and, it, and I've kind of cut it apart because it didn't all fit in one slide. But um, obviously there's a section on, um, oh, sorry, can you just go back one sec, Greg? I'm just gonna go back and just, just quickly touch on that, um, that first one, which is about, you know, um, reads the problem as expertly, identifying the issues and demonstrating expert judgment. And Chris um, gives basically three different scores, but with, with a real description of what each score means, I think it's really helpful. Um, there's also a version with only three levels, which I guess you could use too. Um, so now you can advance it if you don't mind. So um, the, the, another section of this uh, rubric is um, uh, Masters of Substance of Analysis. And this breaks down analytical process into, you know, stating the applicable rules. I mean, this is, this is Iraq, identifying the facts, um, but there's a lot more to it, explaining how the rules and, and, and material facts um, basically apply, um, considering the counter arguments, which is something that my students forget to do all the time. And then it could be depending on the course and this doesn't, or depending on the project and it's not always relevant, but using policy um, to help, uh, you know, choose among all the different outcomes. Um, and then finally, the, the last sort of piece of this is, if you could just click to the next slide. Oh, sorry, there it is. Um, writing and presentation. And, you know, without getting too much into sort of, you know, writing style, because that can vary, um, understanding and producing the document requested, you know, if you've been, at, you know, you're, you're tasking students with writing a letter and they write a memo, it's an attention to detail that might seem small, but it's, it could potentially affect them in the real world. That's not, you know, a, a partner in a law firm is not going to want you to make a mistake like that, even something small like that. So understanding what documents need to be presented, what needs to be included in that document, answering all the questions that have been asked, um, and, and not wasting time giving information about, uh, in, you know, questions that have not been asked, um, presenting it in a well-organized manner. And finally, you know, well-crafted. And I think well-crafted, you can give your students, depending on who's in your class, you can give them a lot of feedback about how they can improve and where they're strong. And I think this is just really helpful. Um, and then what, what Chris has is there's sort of like a scoring feature, which I think you can kind of adapt and use as you want based on the strengths of your class, based on you know, their abilities. You can set your own scale for the range um, of points that you expect for exceptional work product or strong or reasonable or completed or substantial or um, you know, substantial uh, weaknesses or incomplete or not acceptable. 
Um, and this gives, you know, at least for me, because not only like, you know, in this, in this class that I teach in, um, in fall of 2L, it changes year to year because I have different, you know, it's a small class. I'll usually have anywhere from 15 to 25 students in it. And last year's class was not a particularly strong class. The year before that I had a very strong class. So my scale would be very, very different. Um, and it's been, you know, and then you can obviously give more, more detailed feedback too. Um, and, and, you know, the thing is, I think obviously rubrics are, are helpful for us. Um, they help us grade material, but I think that we have to always remember that we have to show students how to use these rubrics, not just how to interpret them, but how to use them themselves. And so what we try to do in our class, and it's difficult, and I'm still sort of thinking about how I'm gonna do this in an online uh, way, but I know it can be done, which is like having them use rubrics to grade samples and then go over that, those, those samples in class, having them grade their own work having them grade, you know, peer review, anonymous peer review of other people's work. I think um, sometimes what happens is, you know, if you give a student a rubric to grade their own work, they're going to think everything they did was right. And they're going to say, of course I said that. Of course I have that in there. I don't know why I didn't have that in there. But if you show them, you know, a great paper, an okay paper, an eh paper, and a terrible paper, and you take them through the rubric, and then, you know, possibly they grade other people's and they get feedback from other students, all those things help them develop their skills, um, you know, kind of as an editor, which, you know, I was, you know, you know, after practicing law and before going into legal education, I was in, um, I was, I wrote uh, a legal newsletter for a long time and I was an editor. And, and I think that being an editor obviously makes you a much better writer. And I think that was actually where I learned how to write was editing other people's work. So, Getting students to do that, I think, makes them stronger writers, too. And you can use a rubric effectively to do that. Okay, well, we're going to talk a little bit about um, another kind of assessment. So we talked about uh, uh, sort of the two styles of multiple choice questions, we talked about essays. This is about the practice skills type assessment, where we assign students a real life practice task and use that as both part of the teaching of the material as well as, of course, giving people a sense of whether they're getting it or whether they're making progress. So it takes a lot of the same learning objectives that we have had before for our other formative assessments, and it adds a little bit to them. So principally, if you look at the bottom of this list here, you see that it adds advising skills in, right into the uh, formative assessment process on the particular topic. Uh, for the student to be able to develop the ability to do things like educating the client about a particular area of law or explaining things in a simpler way so the clients can understand it. You see student work all the time that you understand, but they don't understand or the clients wouldn't understand because of the way it was written and designed. And perhaps most importantly, these practical exercises, when used as part of your overall formative assessment, build self-efficacy. Students believe they actually can do this. So when they go out and they start practicing and they have that first big assignment or they get that first client in if they should happen to hang a shingle, they have a little bit more confidence in the ability of themselves to conduct themselves like a lawyer in that setting. Very important piece of what we're trying to train them to do throughout our law school education. So here's an example of a very simple kind of practical skills training exercise um, happens to be from the law of easements. Uh, we've got um, some land. We've got some piece of land that's kind of trapped among other pieces of land. And uh, the farmer wants to get his cattle across somebody else's land. But oops, nobody probably realizes that there's actually an easement next to that road. And uh, the easement holder has a certain set of rights that we have to advise the client about. So the challenges in this scenario, of course, are not only understanding the substantive law of how you create an easement, those are the facts, you can read them as we're talking. How do we go about creating one? What sort of documents are called for? But also, what do we do about this other easement that appears to already exist that we have to cross in order for us to enact the one that we're interested in? So there are two tasks signed for this particular um, a process and it involves more than uh, just one thing for the student to have to think their way through. They have to be able to figure out which documents they'll need to draft. 
because we didn't tell them in order to effectuate this action for the client. So good chance, unless we do tell them, and we could if we want to make the problem a little easier, we can give them a kind of a mini library of the sort that would make it a closed universe problem. Uh, or we can call on them to make the guess. Uh, or we can tell them one of the things that they need and not the other one and tell them that there are other things that they're going to have to figure out what they need to do with it. Um, and then, of course, the advice memo to the client, which is, of course, triggering that outcome we were talking about just a second ago as to how well the student can explain and discuss the particular law with the client. As we all know, uh, we learned a lot from having to explain it to our clients, right? Because the old adage about having to teach it makes you understand it better. Same is true when you're actually in the practice of law. So what we have done at my school presently is to incorporate a practical skills practice in almost every week's activity for the students. Uh, students at St. Francis write extensively and they'll write three times a week, almost every single time, some kind of assignment. And uh, many of those assignments take a form a little bit like this. And so what they'll have to turn in, the, the sort of the artifact of their work, will be those necessary practice documents. And if that looks like too much, we can break it up over a couple of different modules or portions of the materials. But uh, from many years now of experience with doing it, uh, you know, people leave those programs are actually feeling like they, they could go do something in their area of law. And we think that's really important to the way we actually teach uh, law and uh, train lawyers. So practical skills, kinds of examples of formative assessment, some of the most valuable things that you can actually do with your classes. Back to you, Nicole. So just we mentioned metacognition earlier, and this is just an area that I'm particularly interested in because um, I think that the more we can help students understand, um, you know, and really, you know, understand their own learning strategies and what works for them, um, the more we can help them become better learners and get more out of law school and, and you know, and just have a better career and better better life, better everything. So just stepping back a little bit, what is metacognition? Um, metacognition is an awareness about your learning, what strategies are more or less effective for you. Um, and, and also the ability to regulate and monitor that by stepping back and reflecting on what's worked and what hasn't and self-assessing and then, you know, pivoting, changing, adapting, um, trying new methods that might work or might not work or might improve and, and not necessarily giving up on things that you did well before. So it's kind of this, um, it's this rolling process that always changes and I think probably changes as we grow and become better learners. Maybe our learning strategies actually change too. Um, and so we've done a lot with this um, and, and I think that the online um, capabilities are really great. So we've, um, First of all, you know, I, th I think I mentioned uh, uh, Jen Gunlock, who's one of my colleagues, um, is, is heading us up on a, um, we have a grant to look into metacognitive strategies and impact on bar success. Um, and in addition, all my classes and, you know, all the, the skills classes that we, that we offer um, or that we require for our students um, at Hofstra, we build metacognitive evaluations and self-evaluations in throughout the semester. Um, we basically ask them early on about their learning styles and about their experiences. We get them, remember, so it's second semester, first year. They've already had the first semester where they obviously didn't do well, which is why they wound up in our class. And so having them go back and review their best exam and their worst exam, and not just look at the grades, but really look at the feedback and really and answer a series of questions about where they struggled and where they were strong and how they prepared and how they studied, how they did their coursework throughout the semester. All those kinds of things I think are really helpful to them and something that maybe before this we really didn't focus enough on or get our students to focus enough on this. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm feeling very optimistic that metacognitive uh, uh, evaluations throughout the semester are another really valuable formative assessment that doesn't necessarily tie to a specific skill or, or a specific 
substantive area, but actually will impact all those um, tremendously. So I think I have one more slide on this. Um, Thanks. So just, you know, again, you know, it's, it's um, how can you really measure this? How can you really measure metacognition? You can do it through test taking strategies, study strategies, review of assessments. Um, and again, you know, sort of the regulation and the, um, reflection and self analysis and pivoting. I guess this is really a little bit duplicative. So I guess my metacognition would be, you know, I'm not going to use this slide again. Um, no. Uh, Shall I go on to? Yeah, uh, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. So we have our, uh, we've mentioned a couple of times how the online format uh, it makes this a little bit easier for you. Not the creation of the assessments, but the actual grading and follow through and giving feedback. So I have a series of slides here that we're going to go through pretty quickly just to kind of demonstrate how that looks in one learning management system. This is the Canvas learning management system. And this uh, particular uh, graphic is a real eye chart. So there's only two things to understand though. On the left, you have the student assignment. On the right, you have your rubric. And this is how it's presented to you as a teacher. And you walk your way through your rubric, assigning points on whatever categories you created. Ours has organization and issue spotting and rules and analysis and so on. Could be any set of categories you want. You have, I'll show you in a second, a series of boxes you can fill out, uh, just like the rubric you saw earlier. And it's really, really simple to do with the tools you have. Compare this, of course, to doing this all on paper with papers handed in and trying to keep track of this sheet that goes with that sheet. It's just a lot more hassle. So I'd suggest anybody who's got access to a learning management system and the ability to put your assessments in there, not only does it make your job easier, but it also makes it easier to track the data that comes out of that, which you'll find useful for your own analysis later on, as will the students. Just one last thing on the bottom right, on the very bottom, you'll see there's a spot. That's how the comments get put in and show up to the student when the students are reviewing at the end of the day. Next up, we zoom in just a little bit on the rubric. Uh, that's an example rubric. Again, your categories could be anything any way you choose to design it, for example, the one you saw in detail before. And then next up, how we see it when we're filling it out. So we haven't, um, we've chosen in the examples I've given you already, which of these blocks we're going to use. But it literally is as simple, at least in this one, as clicking on the box that you think is correct. And if you want to adjust the points, you have a spot over to the right where you can adjust the points. Uh, within the given range for that particular assignment. And it's just that fast to give good solid feedback back to your students about their performance on that assignment. So we go from there to talking about course outcomes. Now that was our assessment of performance on particular assessments in particular areas. Now we can easily also assess how well the student is doing on a particular course outcome based on their performance on that particular assessment. So way at the bottom there, you see the box. That's a course outcome assessment attached to your rubric. That's all it is. You just decide which of those four buckets to drop the student into on that particular course outcome. Uh, could be an outcome that's a substantive outcome about knowing a particular kind of law or some other aspect of the course that you are trying to teach. Quick and easy to click a box to start categorizing and the students can see all of these categorizations so it's additional feedback to them that does not require you to spend a lot of time providing individualized comments which of course I still recommend you do on top of this <laughs> at the end of the day if you do a good job of course outcome assessment you get something that looks like this now it's again it's a bit of an eye chart um, what you have though are all the course outcomes all the students along the left and their level of mastery in a color-coded scheme for how well they did on the course outcomes. There's just one thing I will point you toward. It's sort of uh, four rows over from the left in the stacks. Somebody didn't do a very good job of teaching learning outcome six in this class because only one person achieved mastery and everybody else was near mastery, uh, but not quite there. Guess what, of course, I taught this course. <laughs> so I probably need to do a little better job. Either it's me or it's the curriculum that probably needs a little work on delivering 
learning outcome six. I think learning outcome six was understanding and applying the law around piercing the corporate veil. Um, so kind of a complex concept in business organizations. Um, but nonetheless, somebody needs to do better. And in this case, it's probably me. Uh, there's a little zoom in. That's what it looks like a little closer up. As you can see, each person is just color coded on each of the learning outcomes across the course. And this is what it looks like as you set them up. You create this little box and you drop things into them and you answer a couple of questions about them. Again, much easier if you have some uh, instructional design support or even a, a good strong TA with uh, computer skills to do these things to, to help you through them. Uh, once done, however, provides some really valuable information about how you're doing and how your course is doing, which, as I mentioned at the start, is kind of important today. So uh, we've evolved to a world where not only does the ABA require us to be really good about assessment, but students expect it. So many, many, many of the students that you'll have nowadays will have taken either well-designed or not uh, online classes somewhere along the way they have a point of comparison um, and they will be looking for these kinds of activities and the opportunity for self-assessment that comes from them. So what we say is accountability is the new black because it's extremely popular. <laughs> Everybody wants to see how they're doing these days uh, as they progress through the class. Uh, so Nicole, I don't know uh, exactly how deep you want to go into our examples. I'm a little worried that we may not have time to do this part, and I don't know okay. whether uh, Deb or John, um, what we were just going to do is, is, you know, what I was talking before about wrong answer pathology, pathology with a multiple choice question, just walking through a question, but it might be too much now. I see that we're pretty much at an hour already. So, uh, we, we've scheduled an hour and 15 for the whole course, so if you can do it in like five minutes and leave 10 for questions, that would be wonderful. Um, hmm. <laughs> So I'll 10 minutes and leave five for questions. I'll go through really, really quickly. I mean, I think um, it's hard because I you know people are going to want to read this, but basically um, this is just a multi, you know, standard multiple choice question that what I was, again, trying to do in this question is, you know, not just focus students on why the right answer is right, but having them understand why the wrong answers are wrong and thinking about those wrong answer pathologies that I talked about before, where the wrong answer is not just wrong because it's the wrong law. I mean, that could be one wrong answer, but, but the others are wrong because there's a problem that would identify a weakness that the student might be having, reading comprehension, analytical reasoning, and the like. So if you could just um, kind of click through, Greg. You mind? Okay. Uh, sure. Yeah. So, so this is just, I mean, I always tell students, you know, starting with the question call and I don't want to do a whole long thing here, but I have them circling party names and underlining keywords and phrases and thinking about what's going to be particularly relevant, making their notes in the margins. So um, we can probably sort of, uh, it's hard to do this without you reading the question. And I don't want sure. to take the time to read the whole thing, but sure. this is just a standard question actor wants to get this part and can't get the part because somebody else got it. So he decides he's going to kill the guy and he makes this whole elaborate plan to burn down the guy's house. Um, and he sets the fire and he leaves. And then of course the, um, the fire gets put out by the, by the movie stars valet the man ends up dying. But, um, but the, but the house is not damaged at all. There's a little smoke damage and that's it. And then you have, you know, if the struggling actor is prosecuted for arson, um, you know, uh, of the movie star's house, should he be found? And, you know, you have your basic structure of, you know, guilty, guilty, not guilty, not guilty. Um, and then focusing on the different reasons and, and, you know, sort of what's going on. And at some point I have, just to sort of refresh everybody's memory, I have a slide, I think it's up one, 42, which is for anybody who doesn't remember the definition of arson. And so what I do in my skills class is because I'm not trying to teach substantive law, but I need these to around the students is typically we give them the law. So I would have given them these roles. I would have given them you know, the, the elements of arson. Um, I would have talked about some of the things that might be particularly relevant here, like mere blackening by smoke is not gonna be considered burning for purposes of the second element. And I would have talked about sort of this malicious, like for purposes of arson, malice um, has a specific definition, which is intent to burn the dwelling of the other or acting in wanton and willful misconduct. So 
Um, just if you wouldn't mind going to, yes, that's perfect, the next, that next, uh, perfect. So going through these answer choices, what I'm trying to focus on again are sort of why the wrong answers are wrong. And in this case, the first answer choice, which says guilty because the house was burned during the commission of an inherent in, inherently dangerous felony is, is a trap, right? It's tricking the student because that's something that would be um, re regarding a different law. We're, we're talking specifically about arson and that kind of language gets to felony murder, which is not what's going on here. And, and sloppy reading would trip you up because in this question it says that the movie star died. So if you didn't notice that the actor is being prosecuted for arson, you might sort of miss that and say, well, you know, he's being prosecuted, movie star died, this is a perfect felony murder. So that's, that's obviously something that they would need to do. The second one is guilty because the ceiling was burned by the gasoline. Well, the question, uh, the fact pattern specifically says it was not burned. It was just blackened. And the difference between blackened and burned are two different things. And obviously, one would be the element is met and one would be the element is not. And so that's just a mistake of facts. That's, again, just sort of a, a poor reading um, of the question. Um, answer choice C, I guess we can skip it because that actually is the right answer, but I always tell students, I mean, obviously it's important to go through all four, even if answer choice A is clearly jumping out as the right one, you want to make sure there's not one that's more right. And then answer choice D, not guilty because the actor did not have a specific intent to burn down the house. This is a mistake of law and this is a really tricky part because malice um, with regard to arson has a specific definition and wants and willful misconduct would count um, as intent here. Um, and so he didn't have to have a specific intent to burn down the house. And the fact that he acted wantful, wanton and willful misconduct because he wanted to kill the movie star was enough. Um, and so this, this is a great example of how you can test students on more than just their understanding of the elements of, the, of a particular rule. You can test them on reading comprehension. You can test them on um, lots of, you know, different, different areas, um, skills that are needed to be a successful law student and attorney. Yeah, multiple choice has great multi-dimensionality that way, because yeah. you can touch yeah. on so many different things in different choices. Right. Yeah. So and this is a pretty to... simplistic one. Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say this oh. is a simpler one, and you can certainly make them more complicated or simpler. So just tying it back to your program outcomes, you can see how this practical skills question directly addresses the program outcome that I gave as an example early on. First year practice, kinds of documents you have to do in first year practice in a substantive area. So just one word about the future of faculty. It's, it's a great world. Um, it calls for some different skills and some different uh, ways of going about things, uh, but it really provides a great insight into how students are performing when we measure everything and uh, really understand whether they're getting it or not. Uh, so thanks for being with us today. A good assessment, of course, is the key, we think, to the great courses of the future. And uh, faculty who are good at assessment are the great faculty of the future. So uh, you're in the right class. You're in the right place at the right time. Thanks, John. Back to you. Wonderful. So, so I'll, um, as, as, as upbeat and optimistic as that closing is, um, I'll, I'll, I'll mirror some of the, the, the fear that I'm hearing in the questions. Uh, 250 multiple choice questions. How, how can I possibly write 250 multiple choice questions in, for just one class? Um, you know, can I get them from other, them other places? Go ahead. License them. Um, there are certain publishers who have uh, books that you could choose to use that come with multiple choice uh, formative assessments as part of the package. Uh, so uh, do a little bit of research with your favorite publisher and your favorite books and find out if, in day, if indeed they have it. Almost all the publishers have it, I won't name names, but um, yeah, look around for it. It's a growing part of their business. They understand the need for this. Sure. The bar prep providers have this as well, which sometimes is helpful because they can tie in nicely as you're sort of you know, you don't want to necessarily teach them to the bar, particularly, you know, in 1L, but you can start getting them used to those type of bar style questions. Yeah. Can't help but mention there's a, a quite a few multiple choice questions in Cali lessons themselves, and we've been moving mm -hmm. those that are appropriate into our quiz write tool um, that, that work outside of the tutorial aspect of a Cali lesson into the quiz aspect of quiz write. Um, so many, so many questions. Let me, let me get on that. Um, 
a uh, uh, question about that, that contracts course, uh, Greg. Um, was that a one semester course or two? And uh, how, how big are your, how many students are you dealing with? Yeah, that was a full, it was a full year's class. It was essentially a two semester class, the full contracts per curriculum. So it wasn't just one semester. That would have been a lot. Uh, and the student cohorts were anywhere from 15 to 50, depending on the particular uh, timing of it. You notice that most of that is self-executing grading stuff. So you've written multiple choice questions with good explanations, and you've uh, done what Nicole's illustrated about how to make the entry choices really stand out to students. Uh, there's a lot of great formation going on, and you don't have to do anything once you've created it or once you've integrated it into your, into your course. Uh, essays, absolutely you do. And that dominoes a couple of other questions about whether you do those in the classroom or not. You don't. You do them on the student. The student does them on their own time at, when they complete the readings yep. and such. So how do you, how do you proctor, how do you proctor your, your online exams or, or how do you deal with summative assessment online without proctoring? Sure. Well, uh, the easiest way is to hire a proctoring company. <laughs> so if you host your exams in your learning management system, uh, your learning management system most likely is directly connected to several different firms that conduct uh, secure online high stakes testing proctoring. And so we uh, use a company called RP Now, there's ProctorU, there's any number of other ones that are out there. And uh, you just, they, they lock down the student's computer just like ExamSoft does on the day of the bar exam. Students get a real life experience of taking their exams online in a secure environment. And you have various testing rules that have to go along with that that students have to comply with. Could be the subject of a whole nother seminar, but that's the short piece. What about reusability of multiple choice questions? I mean, couldn't the students be, I don't know, grabbing screenshots and sharing them with their cohorts behind them? Yeah, I'll just say, Nicole, I'll let you mostly, I'll just say for formative assessment, I don't care. For formative exactly. assessment, it's got a really low percentage of the grade. Somebody cheats on a, a bunch of multiple choice questions. They're still learning. Hopefully they're still learning from the process. So it doesn't bother me a great deal. Um, I would exempt them from the honor code for that matter, if you had to, to make sure that things all lined up the way they should. No, I agree. I mean, I would say our formative assessments, I mean, obviously, I guess midterms are formative assessments and it's not true with that. I won't reuse questions for midterm or final um, or anything with a grade that's too high stakes. And I saw somebody else had a question about um, uh, anonymous grading, blind grading. I Thank grade, you. you know, midterm and final blind grading. And, and, you know, I think those I take very seriously, but I agree with Greg. I think that for these little summative assessments, these homeworks, these um, quizzes that you're doing in class, it's really more the exercise of doing it. And, um, and I grade it, but I actually, I think I'm even like sort of lighter than Greg is about the grade because I probably should be a little tougher to get them a little more motivated to, to try hard. But sometimes I'll give them a grade of a one, two, or three. And a three is you did outstandingly well, a two is sort of average, and a one is you phoned it in, and a zero is you didn't do the, do the elements at all. Um, but I feel like it's more about the doing rather than how they're doing, and, they, and I want them to go back and learn from it and, and improve, and I think you can kind of do that. Honestly, sometimes it might even be that you could reuse the question with that same group, you know, later in the semester, and they, if they remember it, maybe they, you know, it, they probably won't. It's really, I don't think it's particularly dangerous to reuse that. Excellent. Um, scrolling through very quickly here. Um, what about what about the? Uh, and I, I like this question. I'm concerned about too much assessment overall. If the students are taking five different courses, you know, how much coordination occurs among your faculty, you know, so that you're not overloading the students, um, and and how much is too much? I, I don't know how to how to, how to measure that. It's yeah. a good question. Um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Greg. What were you going to say? But no, I was acknowledging it's a great question. In the online world, we tend not to have as much trouble with that because the courses are better coordinated. Uh, at least that's the way we ordinarily build an online school. So we, don't, we, can, we can match things up in terms of workload much better than you probably can in a typical setting. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would say for my purposes, you know, my skills classes have a lot of um, homework. We just, but we're not giving them cases to read. So it's very, very different. I think that the substantive, the doctrinal 
faculty is going to have to sort of figure out how to make these assessments fit in within the, you know, whatever the formula is, you know, we have, you know, is it like three, three times the credit hours and, you know, it's sort of, you have to just sort of treat this as time spent. And if it means you're reading one, you know, one less case or, or doing something a little bit differently, you just sort of fit it into that, um, you know, that homework versus class time. Um, but, but for me, I, I mean, we don't really coordinate. More. Well, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say just one more thing. And you're exactly right. As long as the overall time fits into the designed number of credit hours and units for the class, there's not, there's no such thing as too much assessment. In my experience, the students appreciate this. They enjoy doing it for the most part. They like to know where they stand. It might take a while to get used to that idea. For students to get used to that idea, in your class might stand out a little bit. Um, but mostly students appreciate that understanding of where they are. Awesome. So let, let me add uh, just with two comments. One, this has been the best session in the mini series so far. Thank you. Yeah, thank um, you. And, and Chris Franklin, who's apparently online, said, uh, my rubric is included in the copyrighted materials of the te book's teacher's manual, but I hereby give permission to share as long as there's clear attribution and the publisher doesn't object. <laughs> well, thanks, Chris. So folks, uh, Nicole, Greg, that was fantastic. Thank you so much for that. I really appreciate it. We're a couple of minutes over, but I, always well worth it. Um, we'll be gathering your slides and your materials and posting them and the video uh, as quick as we can. So folks, thanks a lot. See you on Thursday. Hi, everybody. Thank you. And a quick reminder that we'll also be taking a look at the questions um, and answering some of those. And they'll be posted also. Right. Good point. We will be we will be trying to answer all those questions um, uh, on the web page or in the community forums. All right. Bye bye. Come on. Thanks.